Hey guys, Zane Hine here from the Nexus Schoolhouse, bringing you another episode of Over Explained. Today we're going to be taking a quick look at the main tank Garrosh with the Unrivaled Strength build at level 1, opting for Mortal Combo and Titanic Might at 20 should we get there. At 4 we're going Indomitable, at 7 into the fray, at 10 Warlord Challenge, and at 13 we're taking double up for that bonus armor. Now, rather than explaining Garrosh, which has already been understood to death by the vast majority of the player base, we're instead going to be talking about the thought processes behind fishing. Now, fishing is basically when, as a tank, you are looking for an enemy hero, and the most common usage is on stitches when you're fishing for a Q. Um, but the usage can be used to describe a Diablo looking for a flip into a Q backwards, right, directly into his team, or, in this case, for a Garrosh who is looking for a flip. Now, there are three main places where an enemy DPS will look to coagulate or group together. One place is by their gate, specifically for Braxis. Point number two is by their globe, uh, and point number three is just behind their tank. And if you can designate these three places as likely hotspots for you to find enemy heroes, it makes it significantly easier for you to find throws. And a lot of the time in SL, that's kind of what Garrosh comes down to, is finding good throws to find isolated kills. And it's one of the reasons I like Unrivaled Strength at level 1 so much, is that that additional distance that that unit is displaced generally makes a pretty big difference in how far you can move uh, before you get killed, because that extra bit of space that they have to move right, that could be a couple of auto attacks, it could be a couple of abilities, or if they're CC'd, it could just mean that their team gives up on them completely. Uh, right here we find the Q onto the Jaina, throw her into our team very easily. We are in a 3v4 situation, but because I'm able to display such a squishy unit, uh, we are able to find the kill there, and then our Genji finds a kill versus the Ragnaros in the top rank. Uh, Garrosh casually makes a reference to a war crime he committed, which is uh, really questionable on his part, but hey, he's not exactly the best guy around. And right here, we're just going to go back to our fishing position, which is mounted up in the bush, ready to act on anything we see in this arc. Now, the uh, beacon comes online, and we do have to deal with this. I'm just going to throw the enemy tank off the point uh, in order to start generating some amount of percentage here. And then my Genji comes in and scares her completely off so that we're able to secure the point. Fantastic. We've got... Uh Percentage generating for the Braxis holdout objective. At this point in time, we go back to our fishing position. So we're mounted up again, looking through the brush, and we're just looking to walk up to an enemy hero and just throw her directly into our team. Again, we get the Jaina right here. Follow up Q from the Tastar, E from the Genji, target finished. Fantastic. And this is what you're looking for in fishing. You want to be mounted up, coming out of the brush, and you're looking for unaware targets or targets that don't rest next blah, 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 necessarily recognize how dangerous it is for them to be in the position that they are in. A lot of the time, there are two types of players. They are the players who understand understand vision and the ones who don't and the ones who do understand vision will make up a very small very high level minority of the player base um, vision is something that people do not play around correctly at pretty much all levels of play um, but it's especially exacerbated when you take a tank like Garrosh and you run it into diamond SL and then you go and punish people who've never had to play against a competent tank in their lives because generally tanks are utilized as large DPS's rather than as vision control tools and that's really what a tank should be at the end of the day is like something that knows where the opponents are at all all times, right? You want the Murden to be in every bush, you want the ETC to be in every single bush, uh, you want your opponents constantly thinking there's an enemy tank in every bush, constantly watching for them, constantly paying attention to what they're doing, and you can see in this game the difference between a vision control tank like Garrosh versus uh, an enemy Mei who is not controlling vision, or at least is not controlling it optimally. In this situation, the Jane has been abandoned by her allies who have all done a half rotation up to topside. So we're able to isolate her and find the pick pretty easy after playing Ring Around the Rosie for a couple of minutes here. Um, this is an interesting game in that we do have the Genji as a gank element. Now, generally on Brax's holdout, you do want to divide your team into three groups. The top group, the bottom group, and then the rotational group. So generally a 1-3-1, one, one, which we've discussed previously on... Uh, uh, Nexus Schoolhouse videos, but generally you can get away with a 3-1-1, which is three in the lane, one rotating, i.e. the Genji, and one sitting top lane. That's also perfectly fine. Uh, it really just depends on what your purposes for the composition are and what you feel most efficient is. Now here's where we make the first intelligent play of the game. I do ping five times right here that I want to kill the Ragnaros on rotation down to prevent him from getting his Molten Core. Uh, this was a rotation that I was actually happy with. I actually felt like this took uh, more than one brain cell to execute, and uh, luckily for us, the entire team comes to follow, so we actually get more follow-up than I required. I only needed the Genji to get that kill, uh, but we actually get like pretty much the whole team, and because of that, this first Zerg wave is going to get way more value than it has any legal right to. We're going to go right on the flank right here, and again, Mei's not controlling vision. She is dismounting me. This is good. She is hugging me very close so that I can find a throw easily, which is, again, good. Um, but because she wasn't mounted up at the beginning, and because she wasn't looking to control the flank, I have a huge advantage in time. Uh, on getting close to her uh, allies without her being able to really disrupt me. 
In order for her to control vision in that situation, she needed to be in this bush mounted up and watching for me rotating in. Then the second I start rotating in, she dismounts me either with an auto attack or a Q, then puts a W down in this space to prevent me from moving through directly to her team easily. Um, we're going to watch the rest of this game from the perspective of the May because I want to try to illustrate better uh, what mistakes this May is making and how you can correct those mistakes in the future because I bet the vast majority of players watching are the type who would be making these mistakes and that's why you're here. You want to learn how to tank better. Uh, I've made these mistakes in the past and making these mistakes so many times has led me to the point where I actually understand how to do them correctly. Uh, now, we're going to be talking from the perspective of this May. So right here, she's just looking to control space, just looking to skirmish with the enemy team. At this point in time, she's lost all vision on the enemy team. So what she needs to do is she needs to mount up firstly, because mounting gives you an enormous speed advantage. And then she needs to start locating the enemy team by uh, kind of by trial by fire sight, right? You're looking to directly face check bushes by yourself. You are in a pretty dangerous position as a tank. That's one of the reasons why you're so gosh darn tanky. Right here, she sniffs out that we're doing the boss. Smart of her, good play by her. Uh, and then right here, the enemy team is going to pop their Alex Straza ult. So we're right away in danger. I'm going to throw the May off the point so she's not in the fight for a little bit. Uh, the enemy team is now tankless and being forced to tank this boss on their less uh, tanky, more squishy heroes. Uh, at this point in time, I'm going to rotate back in on Garrosh. We're just going to go back to my perspective for this short period of time. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go stand on the point, obviously, because that's my job. I'm going to throw the enemy tank off the point, and then I'm going to start fighting the hero on the point that has the lowest HP. And fortunately, the Genji is able to find the triple cleanup. I am going to throw him, and then I'm going to move away from the Cassia to keep myself alive. What the main needed to do in that situation was firstly hug the center of the map so that she couldn't be thrown here or here, and that's one of the advantages of Unrivaled Strength at level 1 on Garrosh. That additional 25% throw range lets you do some really unique throws in my opinion uh being able to dislocate someone from here to here means they have to rotate all the way around to get back inside and it's very useful on pretty much any tank that you want to display so there's a handful of other ones on other maps uh dragon shark comes to mind where from the mid lane you can pretty much throw somebody into your base um obviously all the ones that throw you into the base are pretty obvious right here i tried to find the stone of the ragnars and fail this is a good situation for the enemy team and she finds the e onto me to punish my over positioning and i'm gonna have to defend myself with an indomitable at this point in time the maze just looking to trade with me front to front as best as she can and prevent me from throwing any of her backline. Uh, she's slowed at this point in time, so she has to be a little bit careful. I do end up just taunting her right here. And right here, she isn't able to pop her ice block quickly enough to defend herself, and she wouldn't have been able to defend herself even if she had, because a stun would have come in from the Misha. So again, what the main needed to do there was stay mounted up, stay back on the flank, and when she sees this Misha come in on the flank, she needs to use her E to displace this Misha, throw down a W, and then control this side and prevent the flank from coming in freely, getting off the Unleash the Boars, which is a relatively low impact ult, but still, it prevents your entire team from running away, right? So it is impactful at the end of the day, uh, and prevent the Misha from just walking up onto the flank. So again, this has just been flank control. That is literally all we've discussed this entire game. Flank control. That's it. One concept. It's not that hard to get your head around. Mount up, stay in the bush. That's all you have to do. And a lot of the time, players are discouraged from doing actions like this because your teammates are like, what are you doing? You're AFK. You're not doing anything. They don't recognize how important vision is, how important it is to play around vision. And if the level of the game was higher, if we'd gotten the years to develop, you know, a couple of years into the future, maybe this knowledge would eventually trickle down. Maybe not, who's to say? But I'd hope to see that for you individually watching this video right now, with the knowledge of how to control vision as a tank, you try to do it a little bit more frequently yourself. Because if you can find these flankers out of position, you can just kill them out of position, right? If a Stitches is looking super deep for a Gorge, and you find him in Africa by himself, then he's just gonna die, and there's nothing he can do about it, right? If you're a competent tank player, you're able to find these kills on these flankers all the time, because they're not gonna have the tools to respond to them in a frequent matter, of course. Right here we find the taunt, and we do get the nano uh, D-blade right there to finish off the targets onto the enemy heroes. Uh, and at this point in time, the game is pretty much a wash. It's incredibly difficult for right side team to come back, simply because their waves are shoved in, and because their waves are shoved in, they can't get vision, and because they can't get vision, I'm scary. Right, we're gonna switch back to my perspective here. We didn't really get to see as much as we wanted about the May, unfortunately. Um, but for this point in time, we're just gonna talk about how Garrosh wants to play this game. So. I went topside here to try to interrupt that rag fort. Unfortunately, I wasn't quite quick enough to get there, but it does end up melting relatively quickly. We pick up double up, which we're going to use to defend ourselves from the enemy burst damage as frequently as possible. And then we're going to just rotate out. Uh, let's see here. So as a Garrosh, you're generally looking to stay positioned far on the enemy side, right? You want to position in such a way that you are frequently able to respond to all sides of the map because you can generally find a pick on any given side of the map. Here I have to throw my Ana out because she's getting slowed by the water elemental and she needs to be protected. 
Um, and at this point in time, we're pretty much out for the most part. I can grab an enemy hero and chuck them into us if I want to restart the fight, but I don't really want to do that right now because I don't like the positioning. Uh, right here is better. We're close to our gate. It's a relatively safe place to be. Uh, so it's okay for me to throw somebody, but when the wall comes out, I need to run away. I do believe I end up going down here just because I am surrounded and without a W. Uh, I think the Alex ends up killing me. I do find the four-man taunt. But the Genji is not in a place, resource-wise, where he's able to follow up. And as a result, we're just going to roll this game forward, fast forward until I come back alive. The enemy team's able to take a lot of advantage off this, but they're not quite able to get the fort, defending into a Tassadar, a Genji, and an Ana. Um, the Tassadar, of course, with the Q build at level 1, is able to find an enormous amount of damage onto the wave very efficiently, so he's able to clear that out easily. Uh, and at this point in time, I respawn. I'm starting to head backwards, and the enemy team needs to be a little bit worried because they don't want to be thrown again, as they have been so many times this game. Uh, we're going to rotate forward here until the tail end of the game, and we're just going to again look at the maze perspective. So you can see right there, the Jaina was not playing around Vision, right? She went and face-checked this bush. Um, at high level ELO, and, you know, anywhere above Diamond, or anywhere above Plat, really, you cannot face-check bushes like this. You will be punished more and more frequently the higher you get into the ranks. Uh, and the reason you will be punished by this is because players, again, they understand how to play around Vision, they understand how to respect that there might be an opponent in the bush, and might be an opponent in the bush is enough reason to go a different way. Um, this is something you really want to try to wrap your head around, especially if you're playing competitive, if you're in Heroes Lounge, if you're in NGS. This is something you will learn much, much sooner than you would if you just played SL. In fact, in playing SL, you might just never learn this at all, compared to Amateur, where you at least have the competitive vibe of all teammates are playing for the same reason, they're playing for the same purposes, right? They're all tryharding, uh, we're all in comms together and working together. Right here, I throw the May primarily to get her D out. Um, if I get her D out initially, that means on the re-engage, I have the ability to kill her with my E. Unfortunately, my Ana is getting run down. I don't really have the resources to get over there and help her. The Genji is going to give it a shot, but the Alex draws the damage plus the Mei is just enough to shut her down. Uh, this is good by the Mei to dive deep and find my support, but trading one for one is not ideal. Uh, unless you're able to survive afterwards and keep the EXP differential. At this point in time, the enemy team is 13 to 13 and they need to take this fight. But my, as you can see, they're defending over here in the top right corner. And this is what I mean by when your waves are shoved in, it is so hard to defend because sometimes your teammates will just fuck off to clear waves, but also sometimes they have to. Uh, in order to get vision control of this entire area, of this entire arc walking up, these guys need to be able to walk through, and they simply can't at this point in time, and as a result, they're simply going to lose the game. Not being able to push your waves out means losing the game, and you need to recognize that waves are an important part of establishing vision, establishing control, and they're kind of the subconscious thing that we're all actively doing at any given point in time to control vision. If you want a TLDR on vision, it basically goes like this. Clear waves for vision, and then if you're a tank, go sit in the bush, get ready to stun things. And that's pretty much the end of it. That is the entirety of how to tank. Uh, if you can do these simple steps, you will probably be an amazing tank in no time. Uh, that's going to do it for today, guys. We're going to fast forward onto the tail end right here. We end up capping the objective and then simply ending the game. And that's going to be it for me. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this episode of Overexplained on Vision Control. I hope you are able to utilize these features in your own games. And otherwise, GG, take care, and we'll see you in the Nexus.